Purgatory Explained Part 2, Chapter 54 Advantages Salutary Thoughts Besides the advantages, which we have already considered, charity toward the departed is very salutary to those who practice it, because it stimulates them to fervor in the service of God and inspires the holiest thoughts. To think of the souls in purgatory is to think of the sufferings of the other life. It is to call to mind that all sin demands expiation, either in this life or in the next. Now, who does not understand that it is better to make satisfaction here, since future chastisements are so terrible? A voice seems to come forth from purgatory, repeating these words of the imitation. Better is it to purge away our sins and to cut off our vices now than to keep them for purgation hereafter. We call to mind also this other sentence, of which we read in the same chapter. There, one hour of punishment will be more grievous than one hundred years of the most bitter penance here. Then, penetrated with salutary fear, we willingly endure the sufferings of the present life, and we say to God with St. Augustine and St. Louis Bertrand, Lord, apply here iron and fire. Spare me not in this life, in order that you may spare me in the next. Penetrated with these thoughts, the Christian regards the tribulations of the present life, and especially the sufferings of a painful malady, as a purgatory upon earth which will dispense him from purgatory after death. On January 6th, 1676, there died in Lisbon, at the age of 69 years, the servant of God, Gaspar Lorenzo, brother, coadjutor, tutor to the Society of Jesus, and porter of the professed house of that institute. He was full of charity toward the poor, and towards the souls in purgatory. He knew not how to spare himself in the service of the unfortunate, and was marvelously ingenious in teaching them to bless God for their misery, which was to purchase heaven for them. He himself was so penetrated with the happiness of suffering for a Lord that he crucified his flesh almost without measure and added other austerities on the vigils of communion days. At the age of 78, he would accept no dispensation from the fast and abstinences of the church, and allowed no day to pass without taking the discipline at least twice. Even in his last illness, the brother infirmarian said that the approach of death did not make him divest himself of his hair shirt. So great was his desire to die upon the cross. The sufferings of his agony, which were most cruel, might have taken the place of the most rigorous penances. When asked if he suffered much, I am undergoing my purgatory before departing for heaven, he replied with a joyous air. Brother Lorenzo was born on the day of Epiphany, and our Lord had revealed to him that this beautiful day was to be also that of his death. He designated the hour on the previous night, and when the infirmarian visited him at daybreak, he said to him with a smile expressive of doubt, It is not today, brother, that you expect to go and enjoy the vision of God? Yes, he replied, as soon as I shall have received the body of my Savior for the last time. 
In fact, he received Holy Communion and expired without struggle and went and without agony. There is, then, every reason to believe that he spoke with a supernatural knowledge of the truth when he said, I am undergoing my purgatory before departing for heaven. Another servant of God received from the Blessed Virgin herself the same assurance that his earthly suffering would take place of pur purgatory. I speak of Father Michael de la Fontaine, who slept sweetly in the Lord on February 11, 1606, at Valencia in Spain. He was one of the first missionaries who labored for the salvation of the people of Peru. His greatest care when instructing the new converts was to inspire them with the sovereign horror of sin and to lead them to great devotion toward the Mother of God. By speaking of the virtues of that admirable, admirable virgin and teaching them to recite the beads in her honor. Mary, on her part, did not refuse the favors asked of her. One day, when exhausted with fatigue, he lay prostrate in the dust, not having enough strength to rise. He was visited by her, whom the church styles with reason, comforter of the afflicted. She reanimated his courage, saying to him, Confident, my son, your fatigue will take the place of purgatory for you. Bear your sufferings patiently, and on leaving this life, your soul will be received into the abode of the blessed. This vision was for Father de la Fontaine during life but especially at the hour of his death, a source of abundant consolation. In gratitude for this favor, he each week pra practiced some particular penance. At the moment when he expired, a religious of eminent virtue saw his soul take its flight to heaven in company of the Blessed Virgin, the Prince of the Apostles, St. John the Evangelist, and of St. Ignatius, the founder of the Company of Jesus. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 55, Advantages, Salutary Instruction. Besides the holy thoughts, which devotion to the holy souls suggests, the latter sometimes contribute directly to the spiritual welfare of their benefactors. In the life of Blessed Mary of the Angels, of the Order of Mount Carmel, it is said that it is almost beyond belief how frequent were the apparitions of the souls of purgatory who came to implore her assistance, and afterwards to thank her for their deliverance. Very often they conversed with the Blessed Sister, giving her useful advice for herself or for her sisters, and revealing things related to the other world. On the Wednesday within the octave of the Assumption, she writes, whilst saying the evening prayers, one of our good sisters appeared to me. She was clad in white, surrounded with glory and splendor, and so beautiful that I thought of nothing here below to which I could compare her. Fearing some illusion of the devil, I armed myself with the sign of the cross, but she smiled and disappeared shortly after. I begged our Lord not to permit me to be deceived by the demon. The following night the sister appeared again, and calling me by my name said, I come on the part of God to let you know that I am in the enjoyment of eternal bliss. Tell our mother prioress that it is not the design of God to reveal to her the destiny that awaits her. Tell her to place her confidence in St. Joseph and in the souls in purgatory. 
Having said this, she disappeared. St. Peter Claver, apostle of the Negroes of Carthagena, was aided by the souls in purgatory in his work of the apostolate. He did not abandon the souls of his dear Negroes after their death. Penances, prayers, masses, indulgences, as far as depended upon himself, he applied to them, says Father Florian, his biographer. Thus it often happened that those poor afflicted souls, sure of his power with God, came to ask the assistance of his prayers. The fastidiousness and incredulity of our century, says the same author, does not prevent us from relating some a few additional facts. They may perhaps appear worthy of the raillery of freethinkers, but does it not suffice to know that God is the master of these occurrences, and that they are, moreover, so well authenticated as to deserve a place in a history written for Christian readers? A sick Negro, whom he had taken into his room and laid upon his own bed, having heard a noise as of loud moaning during the night, fear made him run fast to Father Claver, who was kneeling in prayer. Oh, Father, he cried, what is that dreadful noise which terrifies me and prevents me from sleeping? Return, my son, replied the holy man, and go to sleep without fear. Then, having assisted him to get into bed, he opened the door of the chamber, said a few words, and immediately the moaning ceased. Several other Negroes, being occupied in repairing a house at some distance from the city, one of them went out to cut wood upon a neighboring mountain. As he approached the forest, he heard himself called by his name from the top of a tree. He raised his eyes in the direction whence the voice came, and not seeing anyone, was about to take to flight and join his companions. But he was stopped in a narrow path by a frightful specter, who discharged a shower of blows upon him with a whip furnished with pieces of red-hot iron, and saying, Why have you not got your rosary? Carry it about you in the future, and say it for the souls in purgatory. The phantom then ordered him to ask of the mistress of the house for three gold pieces, which were due to him, and which he was to take to Father Claver after masses that masses might be offered for his intention, after which he disappeared. In the meantime, the noise of the blows and the cries of the Negro who had brought his companions to the spot, where they found him more dead than alive, covered with wounds he had received and unable to utter a word. They carried him to the house where the mistress acknowledged that in reality she owed the sum of money in, qu in question to a negro who had died some time previous. Father Claver, on being informed of what had occurred, said the masses which were asked of him and gave a rosary to the negro who never afterwards, whoever afterwards wore it and never omitted to say it daily. 